Welcome everyone, welcome. Thank you so much for waiting. Um, we are in a meeting format today, so feel free to just keep your cameras off um, and we will be spotlit. Um, and also you'll be muted when you come in um, and we'll be just monitoring that. So just welcome and thank you for coming today. My name is Keisha Knight. I'm the Director of Funds at the International Documentary Association and just thrilled that you could join us for this morning where I am in Los Angeles Zoom. Um, I am a brown-skinned woman wearing a blazer and a yellow shirt in front of a background that says IDA. Um, and I just want to thank our panelists today. We have one panelist we're still waiting for who will hopefully appear miraculously as we're starting this conversation. Um, but just happy that everyone's here to talk with us today. Also want to thank our ASL providers and our live captioner, and also Sergio Lobonavia, who is our tech, uh, our tech guru behind the scenes. Um, so today is just such an exciting conversation um, that really developed for a couple of reasons. We're hoping that we have a range of interests in the audience today. And if you are a maker who's interested in understanding how better to use this technology and these tools, if you're just generally interested and know nothing about the field and this, the, these, these different tools, you can figure that out, find some more information, maybe generate some questions. Um, and then if you already know a lot about this space and are really thinking about ethics and interventions and how to, even decolonize this type of technology. This is also the space for you. So we're really happy to have everybody here. Um, and the way that this will work, our, our moderator, Josh Glick, I'm gonna ask him to introduce himself and maybe describe the flow of the conversation today. Um, and I won't take up any more space. Thank you so much for coming and thanks to all our panelists. Great. Um, well, first of all, thank you uh, to Keisha Knight and the IDA, and also to Sergio Lobonavia for you know for orchestrating the tech and making sure everything runs smoothly. Um, I'm in a, a visiting associate professor at Bard College in film and electronic arts, and also have an affiliation with the Center for Experimental Humanities. I'm a white man in a beige sweater um, in front of a blurry bookshelf. Um, and just a note on the panel. Um, that's about to unfold. Um, AI, it's really at the intersections of uh, motion picture production, um, and that really continues to generate so many different kinds of headlines, from Hollywood strikes to high-profile hoaxes to a, to a wide breadth of human rights projects. Synthetic media um, is at the center of many of the most pressing conversations about the social and political uses of emerging tech. And today, we'll have a more focused conversation on the ethical applications of AI and what it means for documentary and the nonfiction arts. And we're fortunate to have uh, three experts, hopefully the, the fourth will be joining us, working in distinct but interconnected areas of practice. And I just wanna begin by laying out the structure of what's gonna unfold. Um, we're first going to hear brief intros from each of the panelists, um, and they're gonna give an account of, of who they are and how they got into this field. They're then going to respond to a general prompt um, that will include uh, perhaps a follow-up question or two, and we'll then open things up uh, to the IDA community and people tuning in are encouraged to share their questions um, in the chat. And so let's maybe just begin with each of the panelists. Um, Raquel, um, yeah, you're, you're up first. Thanks, Josh, and thanks to the IDA and everybody here today for having us. My name is Raquel Vázquez Llorente. I work for an organization called Witness, which is a nonprofit that uses video and technology to protect and defend human rights. So we support communities around the globe that want to use a video to record human rights abuses and then use that footage to get justice or to support advocacy campaigns or to do litigation, for instance. And we work uh, around the globe. So our teams are in across Latin America. They are also uh, across several countries in Africa, in South Asia. And we cover issues from 
environmental uh, uh, justice to racial justice to uh, war crimes and other widespread human rights abuses. So the way we come to talk about deep fakes and the use of this type of technology is that back in 2018, we started seeing this as a potential issue for those communities who are collecting footage on the ground and how it could affect the credibility and the trustworthiness of the video that we're collecting. So we were a bit on the forefront of start thinking how the fake technology could undermine the documentation that um, people were taking oftentimes at high risk. And we started consult, um, consulting these communities, uh, oftentimes affected by mis and disinformation, and asking about the deep fakes uh, or as, asking them about deep fake technology and the risks that they were seeing to it, and also the solutions that they wanted to prioritize in this regard. And last year, we, with the explosion of generative AI and the more availability of tools, we expanded our consultations to include the, the type of um, uh, tools that everybody probably has heard of, like Dolly and Runway, and how these text-to-image tools may be changing the landscape. So we come from this point of view of being a grassroots organization that then uses this information and uses this very deep consultative work we, did, we do with communities that oftentimes do not have a voice on how technology gets shaped, and then try to get that input into policy, legislative, and technical interventions to shape that conversation and the technologies that will impact all of us eventually. So I'm gonna leave it here, but that's like the point of view that we come from at Witness, and I will explain a bit more the experimentation we've been doing with generative AI tools and why we are interested on identity protection. Great, thanks so much. I guess next up is uh, Ruben Hamlin and Sophie Compton. Can you just share a little bit about who you are and what you do? Uh, hi, uh, so my name is Ruben Hamlin. I am one of the directors of Another Body, which is a new film which premieres in the US today um, in New York City at IFC Center. It follows the story of an American college student, an engineering student, who discovered that one day that someone had made and distributed deep fake pornography of her. Um, and following that, it follows her mission to sort of pursue justice in a legal context where there aren't provisions for sort of survivors of this form of abuse. Him, so um, and we, so uh, I can't figure it out. We incorporate um, deepfake technology into yeah. the into the film as a as a mechanism for protecting our our subjects. Two of our subjects. Um, needed to be anonymous in the film and we use deepfake technology to offer them a face fail um and so uh and I should describe myself I am a white blonde male wearing a navy jumper with um off-white stripes that run from my neck down my arms yeah. against the blur background Hi everybody, I'm Sophie Compton and I co-directed Another Body with Ruben and I am blonde white woman with a pink blurry backdrop. Um, and the other thing that might be useful to frame our lens in this discussion is that alongside making this film, which obviously uses and, and embraces deepfake technologies whilst also critiquing, you know, the horrendous misuse when it is weapon, weaponized without consent um, against often women and minoritized people. We've actually set up a campaign called My Image, My Choice to amplify survivor stories of intimate image abuse and, um, you know, deepfakes being, you know, far and away the most predominant application of deepfakes and 96% of the time is uh, weaponizing uh, weaponized against women to create non-consensual pornography. Um, so we've been working with survivors of deepfakes and other forms of intimate image abuse to tell their stories. And we're really interested in you know, exploring um, both the misuse, but also the, the potential for these technologies to be used to help um, communities that have previously been suppressed and silenced, which I'm sure we'll get into more. Yeah, definitely. We're, we're, we'll, we'll get into it in, in a couple minutes. So 
now we're sort of shifting to um, the part of, of the discussion where each of the panelists is going to sort of speak for an extended period of time, really about some central case studies and um, ethical applications. So Raquel, maybe to go back to you, can you um, share a little bit more to reflect a bit more on the ethical applications of AI for your field of human rights work? Sure, and if you bear with me one second, I will share my screen now because I would like to show you a bit of the experimentation that we've been doing at Witness with these technologies. Um, yeah. Hold on. Yeah, uh, it's all good, right? Yeah, fantastic. Um, so how um, we come to this at Witnesses that as I was mentioning, since 2018, we've been doing deep consultations and convening communities around uh, different countries across all continents to understand the risk of deep fakes. And over the last year, we also wanted to start looking at the potential of generative AI tools for human rights advocacy. And one of the uses that we identified was identity protection. So we wanted to start experimenting with generative AI tools and playing with them without kind of having an external involvement or narrative cons constraints. And we wanted to understand better how AI could open doors for creative advocacy that could benefit some of our internal teams. And also how generative AI could be used to develop positive, creative, and inspiring calls to action. So we wanted also, as part of this experimentation, to tease out potential drawbacks and start considering what are the ethical questions that organizations like ours will have to think of when using these tools for advocacy purposes, right? Whether it's in documentary filmmaking or other type of uh, public outreach. So one of the uses that we identify was, as I mentioned, identity protection. We also look at visualizing testimonies and witness statements, and we look as well at reconstructing of sites and also at poetic advocacy. But today I will focus only on this part of protecting, protecting identities. So in this context, we wanted to look at how AI could help us humanize and engage better with, with the, the, the source, the subject, the, the, the person we want to, whose identity we want to protect, right? Because um, many of the useful techniques uh, that the backlight, the mosaic ones, uh, they can be time consuming, they don't map the facial expression. So we wanted to see more ways that could humanize the, the subject. Uh, and I'm realizing I'm calling the person the subject, but just like for, for clarity, not for like precisely the humanizing purposes. Uh, we also wanted to see if we could speed up the post-production te techniques for concealing identity. Uh, we wanted to explore whether it will bring up new, use, new use, uses, um, new issues around consent when concealing the identity. So I'm going to show you a bit of this experimentation that my colleagues Shireen Allen and Ryan Kautz did at Witness playing with tools like runway video editing tools. They play with face blurring, with mosaic type of tools and with rotoscoping as well, with AI rotoscoping to track the facial movements. So you could hide the identity, but keep the expression. So um, the example you're seeing on the screen is all with runway video editing tool. Uh, we also try to do it with movement in the context of a protest. As I said, we are a human rights organization and this will be the type of context where our teams will, or, or partners will be recording footage. So we wanted to see whether AI tools will do a good job in these situations that are a bit more dynamic. And the results, as you can see, are a bit disappointing because the faces on the background, they are still recognizable. Uh, you can see that the, the tool hasn't picked them up and the movement is not particularly good either. Um, 
we wanted as well to to try other styles whether we wanted to whether we could style uh, the person we wanted to to protect so i'm gonna show a short video of how this could look like nchini kenya haki ya kurekodi bado ingali changa au haijatiliwa manani kutojua wa kiasi fulani kwamba es una práctica cada vez más común por parte de los gobiernos y elementos policiales no permitir en los hechos. Lakin el hadaf el hayi min ha biyun muhaulat el had o el saytara ala haq fi el tasuir. Lakin kaman el dawa el ochra el fiya qawanin. Lakin el hadaf el hayi min ha biyun muhaulat el had o el saytara ala haq fi el tasuir. Lakin kaman el dawa el ochra el fiya qawanin. So. To explain what it was on the screen, it was three clips in which we have Kenya. we have the original footage where you can see the person who's the subject. And I should say that all the examples that you are seeing on the screen are my colleagues at Witness that have gracefully consented to be part of this ex experiment. It was initially an internal experiment, but they have agreed to to show it to to this audience as well so you can see a, a bit part of our thinking and the work we've been doing so you can see in the original one of my colleagues at witnesses at witness and the reference which is the style that we want to apply to that um to to that person and that will be the subject let's say that we want to protect so what we have as the outcome is the composite of adding that style to the original piece of footage. The limitations of doing this is that, as you can see, they are all very short sequences. And there's a problem of replicability and how you will do it in long form, because every time you generate these clips, it changes a bit. So in terms of doing long form, probably it will be quite limited to use this type of tool. Um, we the, another example that we were playing around with is to take the source video, which is what it is marked in the frame here as original. That is one of our colleagues at Witness. And then we fed 150 reference images to the model. So we use a tool that is called Deepfakes Web. So the reference is another colleague. And the idea was to mask the identity of the original subject. So if you can see the composite is almost like the blend of those images of the original and the reference. The limitations here is that there is not much customization control, at least with this tool that we use, which is Deepfix Web. And it did take a few hours to generate not very long clips. Uh, so what we are seeing, seeing on the screen is the example for um, female subject and a male subject. And interestingly, what we wanted to try as well was to see, well, how well do these techniques fare, right? If we are trying to protect someone's identity, what will happen if we input that um, blend, that composite, into a face ID check. And we run it through the ones that are available online. So they are not necessarily particularly sophisticated. They, they are free. Uh, sometimes you just need to create an account or not even. And interestingly, the return that we got is that it was the protector being identified, not the original subject that we were trying to protect. So that was in a way promising uh, because it didn't pick up the original source that we were trying to protect only the face of the one that we added as a um, reference for do doing the masking of the identity. So I would say that it's a word of caution here because these tools change constantly uh, and it could be also a number of factors why it only pick up the identity of the protector and didn't pick up and wasn't able to identify the original subjects. It could be that the protector, because we didn't do a, like a type of scientific thorough research on it. It could be, for instance, like the protector has more images online that were picked up by the detector tool. So it could be a number of factors. So um, 
it was an interesting out, out, um, outcome of running this through a detection tool that I wanted to share with you. But I would say that uh, with a word of caution of like how much these tools keep changing. And we also did a face swap and voice swap. So, and tried, trying to style in the background as well. So what we did uh, was to use an AI transcription tool to paste the transcription of an interview into Prime Voice and then use AI to replace the interviewee original audio. So we did fake face swap and do as well an AI voice swap and then obscure the location. And I'm gonna show you what is the combination of those three techniques on the video. The ability for every individual to pull out their camera or their phone and film the police or military without the fear of every individual to pull out their camera or their phone and film the police or military without the fear of retaliation, violence, or arrest. Um, and crucial to that is also the ability to share that footage. For every individual to pull out their camera or their phone and film the police or military without the fear of retaliation, violence, or arrest. Um, and crucial to that is also the ability to share that footage. For every individual to pull out their camera or their phone and film the police or military without the fear of retaliation, violence, or arrest, um, and crucial to that is also the ability to share that footage. So what we have seen is an original video of a colleague giving an interview and then we've used um, a reference subject, uh, fed again 150 video frames, created a composite of the image, but also created a composite of the audio. So the voice is as well masked. And then the final clip that you have seen is that combined with a style in the background to also conceal the background. Uh, we wanted to experiment with that because even if, that could be also useful in, situ in the, some of the situations that our organization operates. So I've been mentioning that if you have seen, let me go back for a second, uh, every single title in this PowerPoint has this caveat that AI can be used to anonymize individuals or protect their identities as long as certain conditions are met. Uh, so probably that's the that's the lawyer in me i have a, I have a legal, legal background and i like to caveat everything so as promising as these tools uh, can be in terms of how good they are getting how much faster it allows us to do some of this work how much they allows us as well to maintain the facial expressions so these tools can be very useful but only following certain guidelines around dignity transparency and consent of the individuals so any process that uses AI for identity protection should always have careful human curation and oversight, along with a deep understanding of the community and the audience it serves. So as I mentioned, we did experimentation around other issues, uh, not only around identity protection, but also reconstructing sites and visualizing testimonies. And as we were doing that experimentation, my colleague Shireen and Ryan working with some of these tools, what we started thinking of was that, well, what are the ethical questions that this brings up? And I wanted to do a quick glance over it because it also applies to identity protection and to adjacent situations that you're, if you're probably using identity protection, you may also want to reconstruct some of the sites, for instance. So just doing a quick overview of the human rights considerations that these tools bring on being used for this type of um, artistic uh, um, human rights advocacy is first, what are the contextual expectations, right? What, are, what does an audience expect about the veracity and the extent of manipulation? 
in the visual content. And that is going to depend on the genre of the footage, right? So some films may be more artistic, but for instance, human rights reporting from certain NGOs that are expected to produce uh, evidence or exposing human rights abuses. So there may be implicit assumptions of accuracy, of veracity, of realism. And these expectations may also evolve over time, right? So I think something that we need to take into account as well is that you may capture in footage uh, for certain purposes today, but then in a few years time, maybe revisit or reclaim for other different purposes. So um, that's why it's very important. The second point that I wanted to bring up, which is um, the disclosing of the editing and the manipulation. So any AI output, we firmly believe it should be clearly labeled and, and watermark considered, for instance, including metadata or invisible fingerprints that allow us to track the provenance of media. And, uh, and I know Sophie and Ruben are going to talk a bit more about how they do this in another body. It's very clever. Another documentary that we have uh, watched that is very good, how they do this is Welcome to Chechnya, how they signal to the audience the use of some of the different techniques to mask the identity of some of the sources. So there are ways of uh, doing this labeling and disclosing to the audience in a way that like you bring them along and it's part of the artistry and the craft of, of uh, in this case, a documentary movie. So, but we firmly believe that this type of editing and manipulation should be disclosed. And that's partly because of the we call what we call the context collapse, right? Like you may take a piece of clip and you may circulate it online and then it's taken out of context. And then that um, the knowledge that that has been edited or manipulated may be lost. So it is important to at least try to embed as much responsibility as possible across that pipeline of how can we track that initial provenance and where that piece of media came from. The third consideration that I wanted to bring up is that, and it's, this one is something that has been mentioned to us repeatedly by human rights defenders, journalists, fact checkers working across the globe, and is that the use of AI to create or edit media should never undermine the credibility, the safety or the content that human rights organizations and journalists and documentation groups are capturing. And so what is we are seeing increasingly is that with the advent of synthetic media has it made it easier to dismiss real footage. And it is now increasingly important, so increasingly important that we are able to not that we are at least not undermining the work that many human rights defenders are conducting at, at high risk. And we can see that governments and companies, um, for instance, that may have a lot to lose, uh, they can easily claim that a piece of footage is fake, right? Uh, so when we are generating or modifying visual content, particularly we are working on documentary filmmaking, one of the things we wanted to highlight is that it's important to think about the role that uh, survivors, victims, journalists, people who have been recovering this evidence may have, um, potentially also uh, ideally consult with them, right? And um, the last one I wanted to bring is one of consent. Uh, and I believe like Sophie and Ruben will tell, tell us a bit more about their process, but it is critical when we are talking about AI audiovisual content. And it's interesting here because obviously there will be few exceptions. If we are talking about the identity protection, we are generally speaking about survivors, victims, people whose identity needs to be protected for safety and security reasons. But it's interesting to see who may not have that, who may not you be seeking that consent from, right? So if we are talking about political satire, that may not require the consent of the subject, 
because political satire tends to aim to challenge power dynamics, right? Or criticize and highlight the absurdity of, of systems that reinforce inequality. So I wanted to bring it up as a like consent question mark, because I know we are gonna be talking strongly about the consent of those whose identity we're wanting to protect. But obviously um, we also need to think from like the side of, okay, what will happen with a perpetrator? What type of consent are we seeking? Or are there instances in which um, we may not uh, want to seek that and why? And just to like wrap up, um, I have one final slide, which I wanted to leave you with which are some of the questions that in the reflection we were doing as we were experimenting with these tools and as we've been consulting with communities is I wanted to leave you with some of the questions to help guide your use of AI for protecting identities. So um, just to do a read through the screen, uh, things that came to our mind as as based on our experience as well of working with victims of human rights abuses and survivors. So when we are using AI for identity protection, who are the subjects we are representing and what groups do they belong to? And what is the intent of the content? This is, goes back to what I was talking about before about context and the genre. Like, are we trying to portray that as something is um, fully, uh, there's a lot of veracity on it and realism, or is a bit of more of an artistic type of output? Uh, is there informed consent from the individuals? And if not, why there isn't? And if we're using AI for protecting identity in a way that is not obvious, for instance, voice cloning is one of those that is very difficult for an audience to tell if uh, there's been any kind of AI manipulation. So how are we disclosing that modification to the audience? And having watched another body, um, that was one of the first questions that, that came to my mind, whether there had been voice cloning or not. Uh, so this, as we see, is something that is gonna come up a lot in the use of these techniques in documentary filmmaking. And a very important one is whether the masking technique could be reversed and reveal the, ideal, the real identity of an individual or their image, right? So this is what I mentioned before of like, we ran it through some online detection tools. It only gave away the reference image. So the, pro the protector image, but how resilient are these detection tools? How much the technology is evolving is something very important to keep in mind. And how does the resulting footage preserve the dignity of the individual? As we know, some of these AI techniques can produce dehumanizing results that often enhance social, racial, and gender biases and also produce visual errors, right? That sometimes depict the form bodies. So it's important also to, to keep in mind, are we preserving the dignity of the people we are trying to represent and that we are editing with AI? And the final question is, does the, reporting, the resulting footage, as I was mentioning, inadvertently or directly reinforce these biases that already exist because of the data sets that have been fed into the generative AI models? Uh, I'll leave it here um, and just keeping a few more seconds in case anyone wants to take a screenshot, but I should say there is a piece that I grow with my colleague Sherin Anlen that is online. I'm going to put it on the chat where you have uh, these considerations and as well a bit more on the use for visualizing testimonies and for reconstructing sites as well. If you are curious about all the potential uses of generative AI, for documentary filmmaking and for in particular from the human rights perspective. Thank you so much. Um, I, I know we're gonna hear from uh, Ruben and Sophie in, in one second, but I just wanted to maybe ask one follow-up question for the moment. I mean, a really crucial issue seems to be this question of balance between protecting you know, the subject and their identity, their voice, their image, um, but also sort of navigating this issue of, of disclosure and, and signaling something about, um, you know, the user application of AI to, to the viewer. 
Is it a case for witness that, you know, you all are thinking through issues of best practices for, for, for watermarking, the labeling is, you know, some kind of subtitle often enough, or is it, is it really a, a kind of case by case basis, just depending on the project and the context of its release? If you could maybe just reflect for a, a minute or two on that. Yeah, so there are definitely not standards across the board, and it's an area that even the taxonomy is really up for grabs at the moment. So uh, generally speaking, we ref we labeling is what we call direct disclosure or that disclaimer. Um, for instance, that's what in the U.S. at the moment, a lot of the legislative proposals that are on the table are about labeling synthetic media content. And then we have other approaches that is embedding an invisible watermark. So this is imperceptible to the human eye, but it allows us to track the provenance of a piece of content. Um, now, obviously, we're talking about documentary filmmaking uh, that doesn't will not tell much to the audience because you have to make the invisible visible so it goes back to the label inside right but because there's not a standards around this and because also any kind of visual or audio or text disclaimer mentioning that a piece of content has been ai edited manipulated is not very resilient right like you can crop it you can edit it out it's it's pretty easy to do that so that's why we've been pushing for uh thinking about a multi-track approach, right? It's not only about labeling, it's also about embedding metadata. It's also perhaps thinking about digital fingerprints. So we are going to need different techniques in order to move forward in an environment that is where we are going to see coexisting synthetic content and not synthetic and the mix of those two, right? Because also increasingly we will see video that is real footage that maybe only the audio has been edited with AI and maybe it's only a part of the audio, right? So how do you signal that to a viewer uh, that is just like maybe a few seconds or maybe is this part of the clip? Um, and so it's, it's going to require a bit of like a multiple approach to to the to the issue that is not only about the visual disclosure but also what is imperceptible to the human eye that allows us as well to track the content uh, and the provenance of it and that allows us to do detection right like when we run it through detection tools uh, that it, those tools are able to capture those signals that's for instance what a lot of technology companies are investing on it does have limitations. It's very difficult, if not impossible at the moment, to do it at the scale. So again, it's not going to be only one silver bullet, but a combination of multiple techniques. That's great. Yeah, I like, like what you said about a sort of multi-track approach to this issue, and perhaps we'll come back around to this in, in the general Q&A. Um, for Ruben and Sophie, coming from a, a filmmaking perspective, can you both reflect on some of the ethical applications of AI in your documentary work. Yeah, I mean, we speak like a lot about it, but so much of what you said, Raquel, um, like really like struck me because there were questions that we we faced here. Um, and we wanted to be as candid as possible about our uses of on applications of, of AI and, and synthetic media within the film, but you also run up against this um, issue where, uh, the disclosure is sort of complex and it can disrupt the sort of the emotional process of the film. And if you're trying to present something, which is um, the primary focus is to sort of communicate a story and carry the uh, uh, the audience on a journey that will hopefully be sort of persuasive and compelling and galvanizing for them to sort of uh, join the, the, the fight against intimate image abuse in the case of our film, um, it, it's difficult. And we wanted, we did consider um, coming up with like a color coded system to sort of say this is images being manipulated in this way going through it but until that's like an established and universally understood like language like it would just also cause more confusion for the audiences so it's great that you know I love that um you all are doing this so much of this thinking and, and I hope we can sort of establish a, a language that will be uh easy sort of digestible and understood by broader audiences when they're like looking at um 
at media as more of these techniques going to be incorporated into the um the, the i'm hesitant to use the word content i'm a filmmaker I get in trouble for this but the content we're consuming on a on a, a daily basis um we uh we i'd love to, to show actually like a little clip from the film just to give you a like a, a sense of of the direction of travel over the over the course of the the story um so i will try and share my screen now okay here we go is that good for everyone can everyone see that cool I was sitting here with my boyfriend and my face popped up on the screen. And it was just shocking, like seeing my face looking at the camera, basically making eye contact with me. I had actually been getting messages from guys on Instagram It clicked like, oh my God, people were messaging me because they found me on a, on a porn website. Okay. So um, in this film, from the like outset, we knew that we wanted to anonymize our subjects. That's before we even met Taylor and Julia. And the reason for this is that, you know, we, from our research, we knew this was already happening on a fairly large scale by the time we started researching this project in, in late 2019, early 2020. Uh, but if you looked at the you know news outlets, there was no stories about survivors speaking out about this. I mean, not at least about deepfake videos. There was Noel Martin spoke out earlier about Dr. Deepfake Images. Um, and the reason for this is that I mean, Noelle Martin is an incredible case. You know, she spoke spoke out and we've spoken to her and she says the abuse she faced following speaking out against her abuse it, to her has caused a far more trauma uh, than the original images. The amount of harassment that she faced for speaking out has been of such a magnitude um, that it completely eclipses the, the original her, um, um, harassment. And so um, we knew as filmmakers that we didn't want to put our, our contributors in danger. We didn't want to sort of risk the retaliation of communities like 4chan because a film like this necessarily um, delves into sort of the communities on 4chan. For those who aren't aware, in short, 4chan is like a, a image board on the internet where a lot of communities different congr uh, congregate. Some of them are very innocuous. Some of them are very bad. That's where a lot of the deep fake um uh, creators uh congregate and sort of just trade deep fakes and tips and techniques for deep faking um and so um from the beginning we decided we we would anonymize them and because we were making a film about deep fake technology which had this you know great potential for anonymization while retaining the emotional e expression of the the subjects uh we um we elected to sort of use this this technology um and i will suppose pass over to sophie to kind of tell you more about that yeah yeah so i mean maybe it might be helpful just to frame that in terms of the subject matter that we were engaging with deep fake pornography um this is a problem that is growing exponentially and you know we saw the rise of deep faking as a practice in 2018 on um message forums on you know on reddit and on 4chan and actually this practice of deep faking was originally um developed through the creation of non-consensual pornography of women um and what has happened is that because this is open source technology the tools to do this have proliferated and and also the communities around uh, making deep fakes have also proliferated. So there are now, there are like 95, 9,500 sites that are dedicated to intimate image abuse. Lots of them are deep fake sites. They're gaining four, 14 million hits a month is the biggest you know, deep fake site on the internet. So this is a problem that is really exploding and, and growing at scale. 
Um, so obviously our film is like heavily critical of this misuse of deepfake technology. But as Ruben says, you know, we also use the technology and that that decision you know, is partially because of the way that it can, like no other technique that we discovered, generate this emotional connection with the subject, because what's quite uncanny and, and powerful about deepfakes is that what's underneath the um, resulting image that you see is the real recorded person. So Taylor's expressions, when she moves her eye, when she smiles, when there's a small flicker of an expression that runs across her face, all of that is captured within the face, face veil. So for an audience, you can connect emotionally to what somebody's saying in a much deeper way using this AI technology than you know if we blurred or if we rotoscoped or, or did something else um so but there was also something that we found you know very powerful about this capacity to reclaim this technology and we strongly believe that the technology itself is not the problem it's the application it's the cultural conditions around the way that it's able to be used um and yeah so when we presented this as an idea to Taylor at the very beginning, she was instantly so on board and, and genuinely has felt a kind of reclamation of identity through being able to, to use this technology that, was harm, that has harmed her um, in order to share her story. But obviously, um, well, actually, first off, Ruben, would you mind sharing the next clip? So we wanted to share the moment. Um, we spent a lot of time thinking about when we would reveal in the film that she'd been deep faked. And actually, you know, um, slightly to go, you know, I, I from, from the other perspective than the kind of human rights perspective where the most important thing is transparency. As filmmakers, we also wanted to kind of creatively explore and play with the tension of the audience not knowing the full facts so we wanted to use the capacity for the audience to realize at a certain point through the film that what they've been watching has actually been doctored and that became this kind of quite shocking arresting moment in the film so yeah Ruben's going to play the clip when um when this the manipulation is is revealed about 10 minutes into the film Taylor and CTEC isn't a real college all of this footage is of me, but the face you're watching right now isn't actually my face. It's an actor's face deep faked over mine. This is the only way I would ever feel safe to tell my story. Amazing. Um, yeah, so we, we wanted to reveal that Taylor had been deep faked very clearly, but we also wanted to show how powerful this technology is. You know, since we started working on this subject matter, we've seen, as I say, the exponential growth of the, the number of deep fakes, but also the e exponential growth in the capacity of the technology. And, you know, I find it so fascinating and slightly terrifying and, and really intriguing that, you know, there are different identities, different races, different whole beings that can be, um, you know, layered onto somebody's face. And, um, and, and that's what we wanted to show in, in that clip. But so for the filmmakers and people that might be exploring using this technology out there, um, we wanted to make sure in, in our film, because it's a feature documentary, that it was as seamless and as high level a deep fake as possible. And what that entailed was an unbelievably laborious process of trying to get the exactly right data set. So um, first off, we had to find, you know, people who the face veils, so the person that decided to, to share their face uh, to protect Taylor had to be, you know, the right, there had to be a right match. We did lots of tests and then we had to record um, both Taylor and the face veil in really specific lighting setups, emotional setups, you know, the data set that kind of goes into creating the the deep fake needs to be really comprehensive on both sides. So that's about emotionality, it's about lighting, it's about camera angles, it's about camera quality. But also, you know, we have been really engaged in this question of consent and the layers of the multiple layers of consent um, to if, if, if somebody is going to be using an AI technology, it's so important, we think, to be really, really thinking through consent at every step of the process. So the people that we decided to cast as Taylor's face veils were not just 
people that we thought would be a good facial match in terms of the deep faking process, but also people that really were prepared to, to lend their face as activists to protect Taylor's identity. Um, and that was also a model that was used in, in Welcome to Chechnya. You know, they were um, kind of allies in, in that in that fight. And I think something that, you know, conversations around AI can be really complex. And if I feel very passionate and we feel very passionate about trying to kind of sort through the different types of AI, because um, we do need to be engaging with some of the existential questions. And we also need to be able to see where there is the capacity for these tools to help us in our storytelling. And so something that feels really specific about our use of an application of this technology and Raquel's is that the consent of absolutely every single image in both the source data and the output data. So the person who's um, you know, faces being concealed and the person whose face is being um, layered on top. All of that material was generated consensually. We had to work through bespoke releases. We had to make sure that we were only being able to use that, that material for the context of this project. And there were like really, you know, a lot of thought and care and boundaries written around those, around those moments. And I think that that's where you get into, it's when you can't be so clear and when you can't say every single piece of content that went into this model was, was generated with, was, was, applied with consent, that is when things can get quite complex. If you think about the case of an Holly, a Hollywood actor, you know, there's so many hours of their imagery online. And currently, I think we haven't navigated as a society, okay, who is allowed to use that? And for what purposes? I think the point about satire is really strong. We need to enable people to use creative and interesting, um, you know, to advance, advance technology in these ways. Um, and in the case of a politician, you know, there's one set of dynamics. And then in the case of an actor, we all agree, really, and we're trying to advocate in our, um, in our policy work that depicting somebody in pornography without their consent is absolutely a, a red line that has been crossed and that that needs to be really strongly addressed but what about slightly less more innocuous harmful content what about an actor that's you know represented in a marginally sexist way or a marginally you know um testy way like who does get to decide how that person's image is used um or not is a, is a question that I think we haven't yet kind of resolved as a society. And, uh, you know, Sophie has mentioned uh, like these kind of po uh, points of responsibility for the filmmaker when using deep fake technology that's to the like uh, contributor or subject um, and to the face fail, you know, the normal sort of situation for documentary filmmaker is um, responsibility to the sort of the subject and to the audience. And so it kind of becomes like a triangle rather than um, uh, you know, in this specific case. And so I think it's even more our responsibility to the audience is that when you're working with synthetic media is 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 increases significantly because uh, there is a lack of awareness of, of, of these technologies and there is a new sort of capacities for uh, deceit as a filmmaker. And so because of that, I think candor is, is, is incredibly important. First and foremost, because we're at a time where um, Synthetic media technologies are dissolving trust in in imagery, um, and as documentary filmmakers, you know, trust trust is the of imagery is the foundation of our medium, um, and so we need to ensure that we we you know retain that trust, we reinforce that trust in the face of synthetic media if we're working for it uh, with, with it. Um, we also have a responsibility to educate the audience, the audience, so that they will be more media literate going forward um, and will understand its sort of uses when they encounter it, you know, online or in other documentaries. Um, and so that's why we wanted to be as clear as possible about how deepfake technology was being used, used in the in the film. Um, uh, um, and it's it's this this level of disclosure, you know, really ties in with the with with the consent, as Sophie has has, has mentioned. You know, we, it was incredibly important that we had the sort of consent of the the subjects, and we had gave a detailed conversation, had a detailed conversation with Taylor and Julia about this, because at the time that we decided to use deepfake technology, it did not have the capacity that it does now. We took a kind of gamble um, on it developing, advancing in the in the months that would follow um, before the film was like ready for post-production, only because we had seen this tech technology sort of 
advanced like it's such a frightening speed in the first six months of its sort of like life that we knew when we would be editing two years down the line the technology would be as you know um, seamless as it is at this point in time um and sophie did mention you know our how with our deep fake process we did sort of film the uh the face fails in a sort of studio where we're recreating the lighting conditions and you know that is not what uh, a normal deep faker would do if they're stealing sort of someone's uh, 200 images from someone's facebook but it is actually a comparable situation uh to uh, a deep fake a uh, deep faker targeting uh, a woman who has a, a, a huge wealth of like imagery online i mean if you like look at someone like scarlett johansson you can find her offering every expression and every sort of like lighting condition um from the internet you just need to download that data set so ours was just like a more precise like focused way of getting a comparable data set to the women that are targeted um i do think it's you know we've talked a lot about deep fake but we incorporated a lot of other like ai technologies into the the film because uh the anonymization doesn't sort of stop with taylor's face you know we had to anonymize like so many aspects of this film to ensure the uh the safety of our subjects um everything from the text you see on the 4chan pages where they're on had to be uh, synonymized because even just one of those lines from someone that wasn't even the uh, the the uh, perpetrator, if you search that on Google, it would pull up the exact 4chan thread that Taylor appeared on and her, her identity um, would be would be risked. So we went through, spoke to a bunch of journalists and developed a fair a incredibly complex process of sort of synonymizing as few words as possible before uh, it was no longer that page would no longer be traceable. Um, but we also had to do that for the imagery that we were encountering online. And that's where AI technologies came in um we first i just want to show you two examples of it because we have like a, a bunch um but uh okay i'm gonna share my screen um okay cool so here this is a bit of a strange image does everyone see it yeah um so this is basically where there are two suspects in the film one of them we go down their instagram page uh, to sort of reveal the reasons why that the, the uh, Taylor and Julia suspected him. Uh, it was because of his sort of bizarre, uh, very like deep net internet behaviors. Um, and he was posting some very sort of like strange uh, imagery like this, also imagery of women who were sort of being harmed, hypersexualized imagery, uh, sort of behaviors that seemed to correspond with the sort of the, the behaviors exhibited by the deep faker. Uh, however, of course, we couldn't use uh, the actual imagery he posted on online because uh, first of all we would risk uh, his identification which as a result could risk their identification we also didn't want to be responsible for sort of like mob uh, harassment of of the subjects um that's not our responsibility as filmmakers to uh like put um anyone in danger even if they may be the perpetrator um but what we did with this image is we took an image from his actual instagram account fed it into an AI gener gener uh, image generation software and got it to reproduce a comparable image, which retained the sort of essence of the original image, uh, but created something that was so different that it would never trace back to the original the original person. Um, and that was, you know, one case, use case that we we're gonna bring up. And the second one over this is like, we focus on the videos of Taylor and Julia and GB, the name suspects on it, but as they scroll through these forums, uh, we have to sort of skim past hundreds of images of women women who we are not able to trace and we're not able to give their consent to appear in the film. Um, and we did not feel like we could, even through pixelation, uh, reproduce those images in, in our documentary. There's a risk of re-victimization even behind that shield of pixelation. Um, and so what we decided to do is sort of create images using AI generation software of anonymous you know, women who don't exist and doctor those images uh, to sort of reproduce these these to, as a stand-in for the the hundreds of women who were targeted on these these forums, and so this image was was doctored. We didn't create the image with. I mean, what you can see here is there's semen edited on the face of the woman. The original AI generated image is just the face of the woman, and then we edited the semen onto the face of the woman and pixelated it. Um, this is, you know, when you're working with documentary like uh, documentaries that deal with the online world, and you do have to sort of find ways of uh, representing hundreds and hundreds of images, and you have this need to anonymize. Uh, I think there are very interesting sort of use cases for AI technologies to expedite that that process um, and to ensure the safety of of uh, of suspects who have not given of subjects who have not given their consent to to be part of the film. 
Um, I'm conscious of where, I mean, I have more that we, I could talk about, but maybe I should. Uh... I think we'll, I think we'll, we'll maybe move on to, to Violetta, who's, who, who's with us and maybe come back around. I, I had um, perhaps a couple, uh, a question or two about, you mentioned the campaign that's associated with the film and how many people have been engaging, you know, with the project um, now that it's out in the world. But for the moment, at least we can shift to Violetta. Welcome. Um, and, you know, as, as, an, as a practicing artist, you move across so many different platforms, so many different kinds of emerging technology. Can you reflect for a bit on about the sort of ethical applications, the creative possibilities of AI in your artistic practice? Hi. Um, to begin with, I would like to pay my respect to the indigenous people in which land I'm standing on today. They were, are, and forever be the guardians of this land. Um, my name is Violeta Ayala, and I'm, um, I'm a storyteller, and I consider myself a film futurist today. Um, it's funny, for me, COVID is a game changer. So I was a, oh, I am <laughs> a documentary filmmaker, but I was entirely a documentary filmmaker. And during the during COVID, because I do have a neurodiversity, I find that time really boring. And I couldn't back to Bolivia to finish La Lucha, the film I was working on at the time. And there is no way I could make a film without uh, the characters involved, especially that film. And then I just, I just starting to, I was working uh, also on a VR um, experience. And I realized that a lot of things couldn't be um, fixed so easily. So I became, I started getting really in touch into it. And suddenly um, with all the time I had and I was going crazy, I started, uh, to code, uh, like to do semantic coding means that I code visually, I code with my words. I say things, um, I start describing things to the computer. And in the beginning it was like a game, still like kind of a game for me. And, um, but one thing led me to the other and to the other and to the other. By the way, I have a neurodiversity, I'm on the spectrum and um, so, I didn't, I didn't understand and I didn't see the world like everybody else. And I learned by myself, right? And, but then technology started improving and improving and improving. And as I was learning, and I was learning a new vocabulary and to, and to communicate with the computer, for me, my relationship with artificial intelligence, I believe is like you really, really, is knowing how to read, right? Like I can read for you and you will enjoy it but you can make the own pictures in your head when you read it yourself. And it was, I went back to Bolivia and then I started, I realized that um, the image generators got better and better. And I created um, something uh, called uh, My Own Ancestors. And it was a project that came from um, my own experiences. And is that a documentary? Is that a film? I don't know, right? It, I believe it is It is a film. I believe it's a film from the future. I think that we need to understand that we have these possibilities of embodying film, not just seeing film in a flat way. And um, I can show you a little bit. I start creating my own um, grandmothers. Um, I'll see if I can share my screen. Um, I'm not sure, uh, yep, here you go. Share sound and, okay. Oh, I don't know if you're able to see my screen. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, we are, Violeta. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so 
I went to my grandfather's town and my grandmother's town. And let me, yeah. And I reckon the, the image that you see now, it could be my, um, my female ancestor. For me, it was a way of resistance. I was thinking we talked a lot about uh, decolonizing and I felt I didn't want to fight anymore. I wanted to create in a sense and create a resistance. And so I went to my grandmother's town, uh, my maternal grandmother's town. Uh, my people, we lived in the Americas for um, 22,000 years. I can trace back my ad identity. My great grandmother was um, entirely Native America. Native American from the north, uh, and she went back down 200 years ago, uh, all the way to Bolivia, right? So I, I reckon maybe her mom would look like this one, but this is also my imagination, right? Is is a grandmother that I never, uh, a great grandmother that I never knew. And then, so I created a set of hundred, but I, I have eight that I have had in an exhibition. This is my great, my ancestor, maybe from my great uh, grandfather uh, site. So I recreated them and this was a very personal experience, but I wanted to also give this idea of how the narrative will be. It was a Quechua narrative. It was a different narrative with a relationship with the Andes. So I wanted to create them like birds and uh, this idea of like, they will become birds and I wanted their faces to tell the stories, but I wanted to understand film, not just in a linear way, but how can we tell films with, with the colors, with the colors of the Aguayos and the different feelings. So, um, and I went to an exhibition, um, to a gallery, and they wanted to show my work. I, I And um, two weeks later, I had this big exhibition in Bolivia and it was after COVID. So, um, Everywhere says these grandmothers were, they call the grandmothers of everybody and nobody, nobody, but no one questioned me because no one, I realized then no one really understood what was happening, right? No one understood that um, they were not real and people really identify themselves. And they were saying in this um, set of a grandmothers, everyone in Bolivia was saying that could be my ancestor, that could be my ancestor and brought a sense of a lot of um, love and a lot of caring and a lot of pride. And I realized that it was a, a different way to touch people and to, um, to make us like really understand in a, in a, in a non, um, how can I say, in an emotional way, but also in a, in a way to understand how much was destroyed of us through colonization that that it wasn't for me it wasn't a point to keep fighting and keep telling the stories that hurt so much but in a sense i will use new technologies to um envision a new reality right and from then on i started to just really um question image from the very genesis of image and i questioned myself about photography and I realized what is photography? Photography was also a very um, colonial and extractive practice because a lot of people that take photographs, um, they, who owns this photography? And this came to my mind because my grandfather was photographed by Getty Images. And when he died, I asked them for the image and they charged me $500. And I said, so they actually negotiate with our own images and they look and photographers, when I take a photo, when I make a film of somebody else, I can't contribute to this person. I don't contribute because it's ethically not uh, correct in the documentary industry. So actually legal is legally allowed that I, I use extractivism against the people um, in a sense, and I do have the power just because I have the tool, in a sense, either a phone or a video camera or a camera, right? So I became, in a sense, um, this person that is using extractivism. So in that in that way, I started to um, 
to change my um, my own perception of what was happening. And, um, and at the moment, Lasa Witches, I'm, I'm working on the uh, augmented reality and um, on the physicality of them again, because they're going to open uh, in an exhibition in March as part of Glow Tree at King's College of London um, at the Strand in the street in London. So in a way I am pushing the, the embody of cin embodiment on cinema, uh, cinema, <laughs> cinema, sorry. And I'm looking for different ways to tell these stories, right? Um, so I've been, I've been working with a national, um, with King's College of London, the National, uh, national Gallery, Gazello EO. And this was a little bit of my grandmother's town and my grandfather's town. So that's my um, ancestor grandmother's town. And she comes from the um, from this town where dinosaurs used to walk. And, and my grandfather comes from this town um, that um, is closer to the city. So it's, it's a lot more kind of it's, uh, colonial, right? Um, so yeah, I believe it's very important to understand everything in context. I think that um, uh, it's not a choice. Our relationship with AI today is not a choice, right? Um, if you are connected and if you are on an in, on the internet, you are obliged to have a relationship with the internet. It's not like uh, you're gonna have a choice not to have a relationship with the inter with AI, uh, because and um, I believe that we're not discussing. Um, these issues that we should be discussing and we are demonizing something that a lot of people don't understand yet to demonize and at the same time we're losing a lot of opportunities to um it's like everything uh, if you have a car you can use a car to harm somebody or you can use a car to help somebody right and i think this is very very important like uh it's not the same to make a Hollywood film with a lot of guns that kill people and depict that, that make a film with, with your own data set, with your own pictures and train your own AI and actually create some um, independence to the system um, than, than if you do it the other way, right? Um, so that's why I really appreciate Another Body, the film, because it was very, very, um, timely again, and I understood all of the language, like I understood like the metahumans they were using, but it, it made me question again, something that I wasn't questioning myself and I didn't know. And very rarely I do find that with a film. And I think that it was brilliant that, that, that it was used, that AI was used or the deep fake was used to fight the system because this is the only way we can fight the system. And the only way we can fight the system is by understanding the system and that they have the power to actually do the same, right? So uh, they were harmed and then, uh, yeah, going to the police, you saw nothing will happen, but they were able to use that against the perpetrators and against the whole system in a brilliant way. And I think that it's very important that we understand that. And it's very important also when we're gonna use that. Um, in the film that I just finished, La Lucha, uh, because it was told in a chronological way. And I thought about all the things I could use, but I realized because I, it was a historical documentary of something that happened now historically, it's funny, but it's in 2017. So for me, it's long, long, 2016, it had to be, really, really um, relate on, on the chronology of things, right? And it have to be like that because I think that very soon we have to even change the definition of what is a documentary. And is documentary going to be something that we're going to film in real life? Or is gonna be something that um, like in real life and we're gonna broadcast in real life because we have to start thinking about it that we're not going to know what is, um, <laughs> I don't know, real or truth. We will be able to do deep fakes in real time. We're going to be able to render in real time. I, I have no doubt that my daughter will say, 
in another, I don't know, 20 or 30 years or to her own children. You know, my mother in the past used to like film really all the way and used to um, edit film. You can imagine that was, and you had to watch the film that they wanted you to watch it and you had no, like, I just can imagine what will happen. Um, but if we don't dare to imagine what will happen, we won't even have an input. So I believe that it is key to dare to imagine what will happen and to really change this mentality about um, this tragic way of Terminator 2 or things like this, because that will just harm us more and disempower us more than, than really allowing us um, to fully participate. I think that we live in a moment in time where no one is controlling this big yet. All is, is a war in the kind of metaverse happening or multiverse happening with all of these companies trying to control us. And we actually have once in a lifetime opportunity to change things and not to, we don't have to repeat the few, the past or the present. We, we can dare to be radical, imagining a future where things will be so very different. And this is only one time opportunity opportunity that I believe we have now. Yeah, that's that's great. And and um, you know, maybe this is a moment to to pivot a little bit towards you know the the whole panel and a, a question that you all can reflect on for our closing moments. I will say though that um, if you have some resources, some links, some things you want to share about particular projects, you know, do share them in the chat for those tuning in to be able to access them. Um, Violetta, thanks so much for sharing about um, Las Awichas. And one of the fascinating things about that project, it sounds like the different, you know context in which it exists, you know, both as, as a kind of physical site museum installation, but also the kind of AR direction of the project, as well as, you know, the, the sort of online simulated version that you shared with me it was, um, you know, fascinating just how many different ways people could really engage with the artwork that you were creating. But in the, the remaining time that we have, I'm curious if each of the panelists could reflect on some possible future directions for the ethical uses of this technology. I know the future is incredibly difficult to predict. The technology is moving so quickly. Um, the context in which we use it, you know, changes day to day. But um, if you all could offer some speculation, some hopes, some anxieties, and maybe going back to Raquel, starting with you. I think at the moment there is more anxiety than hope, uh, at least from the side of witness where we are working with communities that are, have been deeply affected by tradi more traditionally speaking myths and disinformation that has now been supercharged with generative AI. So I think I would not want to leave without emphasizing that the threats and harms that are, are very real and are already impacting people and more importantly, are impacting people that were already vulnerable and at risk. And this is why we are seeing women being targeted, right? And this is why we are seeing a, a lot of generative AI tools being used for racist outputs, for discriminatory outputs. So a lot of these tools are amplifying not only the discriminatory biases and the prejudices are, that are embedded on the data sets, but also are allowing those harms to be amplified and perpetuated. So on that very somber note, part of what, why we wanted to do that exploration at Witness that I was speaking of at the beginning was to see the potential of creativity and the good uses that also this technology could have to be able to a certain extent, quote unquote, reclaim it, right? And this is not the only way in which we reclaim it. Uh, a lot of our work is related to policy, to legislation, it's related to technical interventions to help develop standards. So there are many ways in which those voices that should be part of the conversation can be can be actually be embedded in those debates. But in terms of exploring the potential, we've been also looking at the work that many other creatives have been doing, precisely like what Violetta was highlighting of uh, bringing 
calling out against certain biases in society. I really like the work of uh, of uh, this Nigerian artist called Malika Fekwa, who's been using generative AI to generate, for instance, the catwalk of the elders. So he puts elderly people in situations that you would never have thought of seeing elderly people to cause society's ageism. And a lot of the uses that he does on generative AI, of generative AI tools are precisely to fight back that discrimination that we see in society against certain communities. So I think there's a lot of promises in terms of like the advocacy that we can do. Uh, I like also a lot of the work that is on imagining futures and realities um, with more caveats, for instance, the, some of the work that we've seen um, on the resuscitation of kill, resuscitation in inverted commas of uh, assassinated human rights defenders. Uh, we've seen one in Mexico, that it was done with the consent of the widow. And it was also very interesting to see that his message is able to still be carried through, even if he was killed, his voice, his image, his likeness, we are able to revive it to carry that message. So I think there are promises in that area, but at the moment and um, for the near future, the threats, the harms are very real as the film, the excellent film of Another Body, has uh, highlighted and I love that idea of using it's a documentary about deep fakes a very serious one using deep fakes so I do like uh, that duality but I also think it highlights precisely that yes it does have promise but we are using that promise of generative AI tools to highlight the harms that are already creating. Mm -hmm. Well said, and I encourage everyone to check out Raquel's writing and then also the work of, of Witness producing white papers and videos and best practices. There's lots of good information, both on the possibilities, but also the real threats and harms. Sophie and Ruben, I know, you know, we only have like three minutes left. So I just encourage people just to be like, you know, one minute, uh, you know, minute and a half of, of um, you know, what, what the future might look like. I know that's a daunting task, but if we could do that for a kind of okay. exercise here. So my top line is, the classic question, think about the means of production. And I think we need to challenge the power of big tech companies and because they are doing this and they're creating, um, setting the pathways for how these technologies operate in the future without any oversight, without any transparency. And that they have really successfully created a dynamic where it's very hard to challenge their power, they're so huge, they have such lobbying spend. So it's not just the, the way that the AI is being created, what goes in, all of the ethical questions for this completely new field need to be thought through carefully. And that will not happen if it's happening behind closed doors by scientists that aren't even attempting to think through some of this, the ways, grapple with those questions. So that's my call to arms. And and the plug is, please follow my image, my choice. And, um, you know, we're trying to to push back at some of that power in the context of intimate image abuse. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, uh, oh, sorry, yeah. I'll just keep it very, very, very short. That, yeah, the only, I think that, you know, the there needs to be legislation definitely but there needs to be policy within these companies to ensure that these technologies uh really like minimize harm and and i know are really only sort of capable of their better applications obviously there's not going to be a panacea for this it's not an easy thing to do but there needs to be more effort to ensure it i did my one reflection on like listening to this talk is that i think that what all of our work does in different ways and different temporalities is give a voice to the voiceless and that's the sort of the potential um for them that i love and i really hope that we uh, maximize that potential and minimize all, all of the, the potential harms that, you know, Raquel has, has mentioned. Yeah. Great, thank you so much. And Violetta, the future. Um, I believe that we need to think <clears throat> in the ways that we can actually um, understand film and documentary and the power of the media and the power of each of us in a very different way. This is moving incredibly fast. I wouldn't even dare to predict it. I, what I will ask everybody is to open their minds and their hearts to understand what's happening and, and, to, and to really deep, deep, 
deep, deep into this idea of reimagining the future and of daring to create a different future. Legislation will take time and legislation can also be scary because I think the governments can use this a lot against us really deeply. And we've seen now what's happening in, um, in Israel and Palestine. And we see that's nothing of, of what's gonna happen very soon because we're not going to believe what's real and what's not real. And we need this deep education, deep critical thinking. And I think that while this legislation come, we need to have more of these debates because we need to, we can start writing those things like Raquel does, like we need to start writing these ideas and these policies. So our, like our role as documentary filmmakers and as filmmakers in generally as people who understand a little bit is to set these guidelines ourselves. So please do, I ask you to not wait until a government will legislate these things because we can't even trust those governments and how far they're gonna go. So we need to start thinking and talking and put these ideas and these questions and these possible guidelines that maybe then we can push forward and understand that we're not coming here to um to say, no, 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 I don't like this. This is horrible or harmful without really even understanding the possibilities. These companies have, like sometimes I said that OpenAI and other companies um, make Elon Musk look like the good guy. <laughs> like I'm serious about it. Sometimes you think Elon Musk is even the good guy in a sense of how open he is because everything is happen happening behind closed doors. So please do, um, please do talk about it, apply critical thinking, Let's discuss more of this. Let's understand more. Let's read. Let's engage because that's the mm -hmm. only way that we can fight these things. Thank you. And thank you. And thank you to all the panelists for contributing in the conversation today. And to Keisha and the IDA, I'm going to hand it over um, to you for the last, the last minute or so. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much. This has been amazing. I was sitting here cheering behind the screen. I'm like, oh, we need a follow up where we actually draft this code of ethics. Maybe a, maybe part two. Um, really beautiful. Thank you all, and thank you, Josh, and thanks everybody for joining us. This will be posted so you can revisit it on the IDA web, um, our YouTube channel, in the by the end of the week next week. So thank you so much, and we'll see you all later. Have a beautiful day. Mm-hmm. <laughs>